So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mosin. I'm one of the maintainers of the Ceramic Network. I've met a bunch of you in the past. Uh, it's nice to see everyone again. Um, in this talk, I wanted to present some of our struggles using IPFS for our production systems. Um, struggles. Uh, we've used vanilla uh, IPFS, JS, and Kubo, and that's important because we've now got a larger team, but before we didn't have the bandwidth to piece together components that would work the best. So we relied more on vanilla components so that we could focus on building our own protocols. Uh, some of this mix and match that is now possible wasn't available, so we can do more things now that we couldn't in the past. Uh, some of the problems I'm going to discuss have been fixed, either by us or, or for us, um, with a lot of help and support from protocol apps. So I see Steve here. Uh, I don't know if Lidl's here. Uh, Gus is here. People who've helped us a lot, so it's very appreciated. Uh, some of these things could be things we've just been doing wrong, and uh, we'd love feedback. Um, and lastly, um, I'm likely going to finish ahead of time, so uh, anyone else has war stories, war stories, uh, feel free to share at the end. All right, so how does Ceramic use IPFS? Uh, Ceramic is an event streaming protocol with streams of hash-linked commits uh, that are stored in IPFS. Uh, these are IPLD commits, IPLD data structures. Uh, Ceramic also provides additional primitives for identity uh, data composability and um, um, for data modeling across nodes and applications. Uh, stream tips are synchronized by sending requests over PubSub, and the, the commits that are discovered via that mechanism are synchronized using Ritzwa. Ceramic also posts these new tips to Ethereum, uh, bunches them together in a Merkle tree and posts it to Ethereum, posts the root CID to Ethereum, posts those commits to IPFS, uh, and also propagates them through PubSub to the rest of the, the Ceramic network. Uh, this is critical for Ceramic because it is our source of eventual consistency. So these were some of the key challenges we faced uh, running IPFS in production. I'm sure a lot of you could identify with these. Uh, these are the things we struggled with the most. I'm going to co cover each of them briefly. The graph on top is the, the memory utilization for when we were using JS IPFS in production. As you can see, it has a very pretty sawtooth pattern of how it would uh, go up to about 100% and then go back to zero because it would crash. Uh, <laughs> so, the silver lining. And, um, yeah. Um, and that would prevent our anchoring process from completing often and would cause a lot of work to be repeated. We ended up preemptively rebooting. So we would reboot IPFS, rush to do the anchoring, and then once anchoring was done, we would push everything, and then we would reboot it again. So we ended up doing that to get anchoring to work. Um, the bottom graph is for, for Kubo. Due to API calls, number of API calls, or other network conditions, it would also have uh, an unbounded number of go routines, which would result in out-of-memory crashes. And uh, Gus was very helpful. We had a long discussion about this. Uh, we did add. We can and we have added rate limits, but ultimately the best solution would be to have back pressure because you can't really enforce rate limits. You can't, can't hard code them because something could, else could change that would make your hard coded limit not correct. Uh, sometimes there are timeouts without any other reason, like the memory and CPU will be fine and it'll still time out for data we know is available on the node. It will not respond with it. It just refuses to respond with it. These are more probably specific to us. We're heavy users of the, the pub sub network. And it's, it's hard to be, it's hard to, to scale and be highly available uh, when you have pet servers, which is how pub sub works with uh, IPFS nodes. Each node has its own identity and it's not interchangeable with other nodes. You can't just swap an identity. You can't share identity. 
uh, and that, that makes it hard to just spin up more nodes behind a load balancer and treat it like a cluster that has an identity. Uh, there is an IPFS cluster operator, but that's not what it's meant for. Uh, the other thing you can't do is you can't uh, take, you can't upgrade a node without downtime. Every time you, have to, you want to upgrade one of the nodes, it has to go down so it'll release the repo lock, and then you upgrade it and bring it back up. There's always uh, some amount of downtime. This is another, another problem we've faced a lot, pops up connectivity. I know other people have as well. Uh, with JSIPFS, nodes would suddenly just stop receiving pops up traffic and we wouldn't know why uh, if they went too long without receiving a message. Uh, and to solve that, we set up keep alive lambdas in AWS, then we just added code to Ceramic to just send keep alive every few minutes, like, like within a certain amount of time so that there was some traffic going on pops up so that it wouldn't die. Uh, that helped a bit, uh, did not eliminate the issue, and uh, for that we wrote more automation that would just restart IPFS if there were no pops of messages received for like 30 minutes. Um, but JS IPFS, it, well, with that, it definitely helped. But, uh, Kubo does better, but it still has, has times when it, uh, it just stops receiving pops of traffic. Um, and it happened recently. So it's very infrequent with Kuba, but it does still happen. This was terribly painful, migrating from JSIPFS to Kubo. Uh, we had to write code to migrate the pin store because JSIPFS had the S3 plugin for the pin store, Kubo did not. Uh, and, and again, some of this is stuff we could have built, we just were in the middle of migrating didn't have the time to do that. Uh, well, we ended up spending time anywhere migrating the pin store. Uh, the block store naming format was inconsistent between JSIPFS and Kubo. It was like even on the same repo version, it was inconsistent. Uh, and we were terrified we would have to migrate the entire block store, which is probably a terabyte of information in each of our environments. Um, thankfully, we moved to repo version 12, uh, which was consistent on Kubo and JSIPFS, so we didn't have to touch the block store. And it had the S3 plugin with some tweaks, so we got to work. Uh, secure web sockets were not supported in Kubo out of the box. Uh, we, all our multi-addresses were secure web sockets, and we had to change all of our multi-addresses, ask all of our partners to change their multi-addresses so that we could all use uh, each other's nodes. It, it is now supported out of the box in Kubo, so, but it wasn't back then. Debugging, yes. <laughs> I just, I have looked at Kubo logs many times. I've just looked at the first page and then closed the tab because, yeah. Uh, it's hard to tell what matters. Logs can be verbose. They can include errors from other nodes, which has been, has been really weird. Uh, and there's no easy way to identify sources of memory, uh, memory growth, no easy way to identify sources of delays. Some takeaways, uh, like building production databases over vanilla IPFS can get tricky. Definitely dragons, not the cute ones. Some of our problems can, can definitely now be solved uh, by putting together components uh, in a better way that wasn't possible before. Uh, and also building new components over existing ones, which are both which are avenues we're exploring. So putting together a better combination of packages, uh, and there's been some great like, presentations today just about that. Uh, some great new protocols being built that we can we can now uh, pick from. Uh, and it's great to see that the the community is is aware of all these shortcomings. Nobody hides these problems. Everyone's um, forthcoming about them and a lot of people working to fix them, which is great. Now for some fun random weirdness, which I don't know how many people would have seen these things. Uh, my very favorite is the one at the top, is that every other DAG get RPC call would fail. <laughs> like every other call, so every second call would fail. Uh, and that was because the IPFS HTTP client defaulted to using keep alive true for the, the node connection pool which meant it used reused connections, but 
Kubo did not support connection reuse, so it would kill the connection as soon as the first one completed. And, that's, and the second one would try, so Node would try to reuse the connection. Um, and this was also a bit of a weird interaction with the AWS load balancer. Uh, and the IPFS HTTP client would make another DAGGET call. That would fail because Kubo had killed the connection from its side. So we had to set keep alive false to it did not kill every other call. That was a very interesting investigation. IPFS DAGGET can stall for hours and successfully resolve. Some connection limit problem, we're not sure. Uh, the third one's also very interesting. You're, you're, you're connected to a peer that you know has the data you want, but it will time out trying to get that data. And then you give up and you kill that, that IPFS CLI call, and then you run it again and it works right away. And we've just seen this pattern happen so many times, so it's not one, like happenstance. It's it just... <laughs> This is this is our our newest struggle. Some of this is potentially the way ceramic interacts with IPFS, so it's not like a IPFS only thing. Uh, a large number of duplicate messages have been propagating through the ceramic network, and we've adjusted the seen message cache TTL so there's a cache inside pops up for messages that have been seen within a certain window of time. We've adjusted the TTL, so we, uh, with Protocol Lab's help, we made the TTL configurable, so we were able to adjust it to its larger window we set now. And we also uh, found a, a problem with the, the cache implementation itself. It was a first seen cache, so it would see a message once, and then even if it saw it a bunch of times after, it would take the the time it saw it first as the start of its window for the TTL. That way you would see a lot more duplicates get through. So we re-implemented that to be a last seen cache. So now it would be at least X amount of time, which is configurable from the last time you saw the message before it was let through the cache again. So that helped. Um, now we see fewer duplicates getting propagated, but now our nodes are still getting somewhat overwhelmed, like receiving messages that get validated and parsed and then rejected because they didn't make it through the cache. But the CPU utilization is at like 50, 60% just trying to reject those messages. Um, but we're, we're looking at this from multiple angles, uh, from the ceramic side and the, the pub sub side. Um, yeah, so if anyone else has any stories to share, uh, you're welcome to. I think I finished way ahead of time, but uh, that was the intention. Cool. Yeah, so uh, this might be a good session for comments more than questions, um, or maybe answers from the uh, community. I know a, a feeling that we've had at Fission sometimes is like, clearly we're just holding the IPFS wrong. Uh, and. <laughs> Like everybody else here must be doing this better than we are. So, um, yeah. Anybody have anything they want to share? Answers, questions, thoughts? JSIPFS to Kubo. Uh, why did you start with JSIPFS? Initially, Ceramic was it was meant to run in browsers, and then it seemed like a natural transition from it's in JS, run the browser, and now we switch to Node.js, run it on the server, it's no longer supported in the browser, but JS IPFS stayed, um, and then that's, we, we used it for a while, I think a couple years, until like mid-2022 20, last year is when we switched to Kubo. So that was the reason, like it was more historical than that we picked JS IPFS to, as the, the thing. Awesome, thank you. I'm interested in uh, in uh, your kind of interface with uh, folks in the rest of the IPFS cinematic universe. So when you were trying to fix this stuff, right? So you mentioned that you worked with Protocol Labs mm -hmm. to fix some of these problems. Um, there's clearly a few things here where, like, it shouldn't be down to you. They're fixes that would work would make the whole network better. Did you find like it was useful to be raising bugs 
raising issues in, in, in the GitHub repo? Did you really have to like, how did you decide when it was time to like pick up the flashing red telephone and call someone at Protocol Labs and say, this is fixed? And is there any ways that you would like that relationship to improve for you and for, for other people? Because of course, some of these things just don't scale, right? You can't, and yeah, I guess those are my three, four questions. Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> we found that uh, our interface with, so we started out with GitHub issues uh, and communicating with the team on, on Slack, and uh, uh, it's always been super responsive, mostly been super responsive, and when it's not been, it's not been like a, it's been understandable. There's never been like a inordinate amount of delay getting back to us. Uh, there's always been a way to to kind of escalate if we needed to, um, and kind of GitHub, Slack, maybe other ways sometimes, but uh, it's always been very responsive, very detailed responses, timely. Um, we've had to do make fixes ourselves because if it was something Protocol Labs knew and accepted as a problem and requested for like uh, contributions because they didn't have like the, the resources. Um, and. I mean, our experience has been has been good. Running into those problems is never fun, and solving some of those problems is very much not fun when you don't really know what's going on. These are complicated systems, but um, uh, I, I feel like we've generally had. It's I don't know. It's it's difficult. It's rough for us, so it's easy to feel angry, uh, and we've felt upset a lot of times. But that's something we worked through. Has the war been won yet? That's a good question. A few battles have been won. The war is not won yet. No. Yeah. Uh, trenches. Yeah. <laughs> also, did you get up an opportunity to work with Helia? We have not. I just heard uh, from, da from Daniel before uh, this, this talk that he's had a great experience with Helia. Uh, Give I, another shot. Yeah, I, I was telling him it'd be, it's kind of hilarious. Lol sob to go from JSIPFS to Kubo and then back to, to Helia, full circle, full circle yep. Uh, which it's, it's very interesting. I'm definitely going to give it a shot. If, if, if it works well, we could switch to Helia. We need some time before we implement. We've gotten to the stage where you've, our scale requires implementation of some custom protocols. Uh, and at this point, it will take a little bit of time for us to get there. In the meantime, to to address some of the things we're struggling with, if there are ways to swap out some components or maybe even Kubo itself with Helia, if that helps get us through the phase we are in right now, that would be perfect. So definitely gonna take a look at uh, Helia, some of the other protocols that were brought up today. Um, Go Card Mirror sounds very interesting. So we'll definitely take a look at some of these. Yeah, things. thanks a lot for sharing um, with all that you have learned. And if you could go back and do things, or you're starting from scratch today, are there any recommendations that you have? Again, and or said another way, how would you want to evolve things in the future with the battle scars and newest learnings that you have? And totally understandable if you don't have an answer for that yet. It's something you need yeah. to think about. But if there are things that come up off the top of your head, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, I mean, off the top of my head, I think I loved the like to go back in time a little. I loved the transition from Go IPFS to Kubo. I understand why Protocol Labs did it. Uh, it was becoming the IPFS implementation. Now it is an IPFS implementation, not like everything for everyone, which it was becoming. Uh, now, since then, it has become easier to mix and match components. So now people, I would say, should look at uh, picking like the best of class of what they need versus being like, oh, Kubo should do everything for me or Helio should do everything for me. So paying more, paying more attention to uh, individual components and how to like put them together. Hopefully that keeps getting easier. I know it is easier now than it was in the past. If it keeps getting easier, that would be one recommendation would be to, to pick what you need versus just picking. Not every team can do that though. We're probably in a position where we can now if we wanted to, but the easier it gets, the easier smaller teams can just be like, oh, I want these six packages. That's all I need and I'll put them together. The easier it gets, the easier it'll be for smaller teams to do that. Uh, so that's one of the things I'll say. 
so Danny kind of asked this, um, and you answered of like sort of like how was connecting in and everything else. Um, so Fission and, and James already kind of said it where, uh, you know, we spent a long time, and again, it was, Go IPFS was in a, a lot clunkier stake. Uh, you know, we found every release and continues to be, to be better. Um, but we were sort of wandering around in the wilderness for six months, nine months before we pierced the veil um, of PL, um, specifically Cake and Y. Uh, we're like, oh yeah, totally, yeah, yeah. Like ignore those public channels where everyone's like, why the fuck stuff doesn't work? Here's the three people to talk to. Um, so I wanted to just like add that for the record. Um, um, I think there's actually still not good onboarding for IPFS operators, that the default experience is, I threw it up, I ran it, what that face basically, <laughs> um, and a bunch of us have now been like, oh, you know, we know where the bodies are buried. Don't touch that port. Port. What do you mean? Everybody turns off garbage collection in production, right? <laughs> Again, laughter from everyone, right? Um, um, but but that's not reflected in public documentation um, or best practices. So I really want to take this as a call for great. We should reboot IPFS operators. <laughs> We should continue to make it as an on-ramp for folks, and we should continue to work together in looking for saying like, hey, we're about to put two engineers on something for six months. Before we do this, <laughs> does someone else want to help? And I say that very like collaboratively sort of thing, right? Like we're actually still sort of in a situation where we're like, well, thank God Gus is running all of those test runners. <laughs> Um, and in part, I now understand why we haven't been able to help more. Um, so that was really helpful for me. So, you know, I also picked in what you were saying just recently. So this is the question part of my comment. Um, uh, was, was that uh, you're like, oh, we're about to start doing some, you know, at our scale and for our use case, we now need to do some custom stuff. So we're going to like look around for sort of things like that. Um, and I, that's the same sort of thing. I'd love for us to be able to be like, like, like actually tell everyone in the community, hey, if you're about to embark on that six months, two engineers sort of thing, let's talk to see one, who else wants to throw money, resources, requirements, what's whatever into the pot. All, this is always hard because ultimately it's like, no, we need, we need to move quickly for our own resources or like wh wh whatever kind of thing like that. Um, so maybe just like, again, sort of like a public call for like, hey, awesome. At the very least, it would be amazing for you to publish, like, here's what we're trying to do, and we ended up picking up X whenever, whatever you decide to do, so that we can all learn, slash, have an opportunity to say, like, oh yeah, that's great, we'll totally contribute in in X way. Does that make sense? It does, and it's funny you say that. There actually is a write-up of what we're planning. Nathaniel has written up. It's. Uh, it's been shared in some places, I think, with the Number Zero team, or some people it has been shared with. Uh, it just had not been broadcasted, but that's a great idea. Uh, we'll definitely send it out to more people. Um, so definitely that's a, that's a good point. And the other thing I was going to say is uh, thank you for starting the IPFS Operators Challenge. I know you and Brooke did that. It's, it's been kind of a, like a, a godsend because it's a way to pierce the veil. It's not just one issue among... I don't know how how many issues on Kubo now. Thousand, twelve hundred. So it's just it's not one issue among twelve hundred. Now it's like there's an issue and there's some escalation path at least. So uh, both great points. Thank you. Um, the other point I wanted to make slightly more generally. So we had the specific instances of rather than getting any kind of back pressure, if you sent too many requests at Kubo, it just fell over and then you rebooted it and now you're back in a healthier state. And when Gossip Sub, the slowest node on the network is the one that is verifying too many signatures and suddenly has a queue that is longer than the timeout time. So every message it verifies is out of the timeout window because that's how long the queue is. So you can have a channel that's got 30 real data center servers on it that is dealing with this flood of traffic because a Raspberry Pi can't keep up with the channel and just keeps throwing the messages back in five minutes after they happened. 
thinking about ways to make stuff gracefully degrade, I think would be very helpful of maybe if the Raspberry Pi can't keep up, it would be nice if the Raspberry Pi had a bad time, but the like racks of servers in data centers were still happy. And I think there's just a few places in Kubo where taking this approach of, okay, how can some know, I mean, I know a lot of people define a distributed system as when a computer you didn't know existed can break your code, but there's definitely these times where like, we weren't even being deliberately attacked. It was just a slow node brought the whole channel down. Nonetheless, how do you protect a pub sub channel from someone who's deliberately trying to spam the thing? Awesome. Thank you, everyone.